Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Michael Alec? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Michael Allig was born in South Bend, Indiana, on April 29, 1966. His mother was from Germany. She moved to the United States after marrying his father. When Michael was four years old, his parents divorced. He lived with his mother. Michael performed well academically. He was a straight-A student in high school. He was bullied in school frequently because of his homosexuality, which he initially tried to keep a secret. Michael attended Fordham University in New York after graduating high school in 1984. He believed that it would be a more liberal environment, but soon realized it was too conservative for him. In 1985, he transferred to the Fashion Institute of Technology. He only lasted a year there. Michael became active in the New York City nightlife after being introduced to it by his boyfriend. He became a busboy at a well-known dance club called Danceateria. Michael took an interest in being a club promoter and started to achieve success in this area. He formed a group of young people who would later become known as the Club Kids. They were known for dressing up in unusual, colorful, bizarre, and flamboyant costumes. The Club Kids would hang out at various nightclubs and increase the traffic, mostly by encouraging drug use and sometimes even by distributing drugs directly. They became a key attraction at many of the locations to such an extent that Michael was eventually earning quite a bit of money. People were on edge waiting for the next outrageous and offensive action to be taken by the club kids, but the real attraction was the drugs. The club kids became part of the counterculture in Manhattan. Over time, they attracted media attention, appearing on television shows like Geraldo and Donahue. In 1988, Michael was hired to organize parties at a club called The Limelight, which was owned by a man named Peter Gation. Michael met with tremendous success, which led Peter to hire him at other nightclubs which he owned. The club kids would stage illegal street parties in public places, which attracted the attention of law enforcement, who were already interested in the club scene because of the rampant use of drugs. Michael was under constant pressure to remain interesting and relevant, he continually tried to come up with even more offensive and shocking routines, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. Michael tried various tactics to attract attention. He would urinate on club goers and in their drinks, run into people and knock them to the ground, and throw $100 bills on the dance floor to create chaos and danger. Michael and the club kids had been using various drugs for some time, like ecstasy and ketamine, but eventually Michael started using heroin. He was arrested several times and entered into substance use treatment programs, but nothing seemed to dissuade him from continued use. Peter sent Michael to a rehabilitation program in 1995. Michael did not complete the program and Peter fired him. Michael continued to work at various nightclubs, but his drug use was becoming even more problematic. In particular, his use of heroin was out of control. One of the many people who sold drugs to Michael was a man named Andre Melendez. He went by the name Angel because wings were part of his costume. In addition to being a drug dealer, he aspired to be a member of the club kids. He would sometimes supply drugs for free in order to get close to Michael. Angel was on the payroll of some of the nightclubs because Michael arranged it. For example, he was paid $200 a night at the limelight, even though Michael didn't work there anymore. Eventually, the relationship between Michael and Angel deteriorated. Michael owed Angel money for drugs. On March 17, 1996, Angel went to the limelight and demanded money that he was owed. The bouncers told him to get out. He refused, and the bouncers broke his wings as they threw him out of the nightclub. Angel made his way to Michael's apartment. Here's what happened next, according to Michael. Michael and a man named Robert Riggs were in the apartment. They were both high on a number of different drugs, including ketamine. 
Angel was mad at Michael because Michael had been taking drugs from him and Michael owed him money. In addition, Angel was upset because he had just been kicked out of the limelight without being paid. Angel initiated a physical altercation with Michael. Robert came up behind Angel and struck him in the head with a hammer three times. Angel did not survive this attack. Michael and Robert placed Angel's body in the bathtub and filled the bathtub with ice. Michael and Robert spent the next several days continuing to use drugs and partying in various places in New York City. About five to seven days after the murder, the smell from Angel's body grew too intense for the men to ignore. Robert purchased some knives from Macy's. He gave Michael ten bags of heroin to dismember Angel's body. Michael cut Angel's legs off. He put each leg in a garbage bag, then in a duffel bag. Angel's torso was placed in a large cardboard box that was from a Zenith television set. Michael used duct tape to secure the box closed. The men took a taxi to the West Side Highway. They exited the taxi and threw Angel's remains in the Hudson River. The duffel bags containing Angel's legs sank right to the bottom, but the box containing his torso floated away. Later, Robert would give his version of events. It was pretty close to what Michael said, except he added a few things. For example, he said that during the attack, Michael had tried to suffocate Angel with a pillow, and Michael poured something like Drano down Angel's throat after he was dead. Michael would later insist that he only put the Drano in the bathtub with Angel. After the murder and body disposal, Michael continued his party lifestyle and club promoting. He told many people that he and Robert had murdered Angel, even supplying details like the fact that Angel was killed with a hammer and his legs were cut off. Michael wrote the word guilty on his forehead. Initially, people thought that Michael was joking. After all, he was having trouble attracting as much attention with his offensive behavior. They figured this was just the next level of ludicrous behavior. They viewed Michael as pathetic, but not as a killer. Over time, their opinions changed. They still believed that Michael was pathetic, but now they also believed that Michael probably did kill Angel. Interestingly, the vast majority of them never said anything to the authorities. Angel's body was discovered in Staten Island in April 1996, the month after the murder. But the coroner thought that he was Asian. Also, there was a delay in communicating with the authorities in Manhattan because the body was found in a different borough. Michael tried to make a comeback in September 1996, but it would be short-lived. Angel's body was identified in November 1996. By this time, several media outlets had run stories about claims that Michael was making about being a killer. Michael now changed his story. He claimed that when he told people that he'd murdered Angel, he was just joking. Before Michael could be arrested, he fled to Toms River, New Jersey, probably believing that nobody would be brave enough to follow him into New Jersey. On December 5, 1996, he was arrested there without incident. Michael accepted a plea deal where he pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter and was sentenced to only 10 to 20 years in prison. Robert was offered the same deal and accepted it. Michael had a rough time in prison. He was beat up several times. Somehow, he managed to get a hold of heroin and was placed in solitary confinement as a punishment. According to Michael, he spent five years in solitary. Michael was denied parole for the first time he was eligible in 2006. Michael tested positive for using drugs, and the parole officers had watched the 2003 movie Party Monster. This fictionalized account of Michael's adventures starred Macaulay Culkin as Michael. It's not clear if the parole officers were offended by Michael's behavior or how terrible the movie was. I think it was based on how the movie characterized his behavior, because if it was based on the quality of the acting in the movie, Michael never would have been released from prison. Michael was denied parole again in 2008 after failing multiple drug tests. On May 5, 2014, Michael was granted parole. He was ordered to receive mental health counseling for anger and substance use. On October 15, 2014, Michael released a song which was produced by a record label in Texas. In May of 2015, he displayed some of his paintings at a fair in New York. Michael was arrested on February 2, 2017, 
The police said he was trespassing and smoking crystal meth. He pleaded guilty to trespassing. On December 24, 2020, Michael was at his apartment in Washington Heights, Manhattan. He was using heroin, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. He accidentally overdosed and died. He was 54 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Reportedly, Michael was diagnosed with histrionic personality disorder. The clinician who made the diagnosis said that it was the worst case he had ever seen. The disorder has eight symptom criteria. Discomfort when not the center of attention, inappropriate sexually seductive or provocative behavior, a rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions, using physical appearance to draw attention to oneself, excessively impressionistic speech, self-dramatizing and theatrical behavior, being suggestible, and evaluating relationships as more intimate than they actually are. Michael's behavior appears to align with most, if not all, of these symptom criteria. He was clearly lively, dramatic, talkative, the life of the party. Michael created a scene and was deceptive when he was not getting enough attention. Histrionic personality disorder does not explain Michael's violent behavior, but it does explain why he confessed to his friends. He was using the homicide he committed to keep everybody focused on him. Item number two, some of the club kids would distribute drugs to club goers. On occasion, they would give the drugs away for free, which is really why they were so popular for a time. This is a challenging business model because someone needed to pay for the drugs. This led them to taking advantage of innocent and vulnerable drug dealers like Angel Melendez. He was willing to supply drugs for free or at a discount to be included. He desperately wanted to be a club kid. Angel is often painted as a misguided young man who was on the verge of turning his life around. I doubt this is true, but Angel did not deserve to be murdered either way. Item number three. After Michael was released from prison, he gave a number of interviews. Everybody was trying to figure out if Michael was truly remorseful or if he was psychopathic. During his many interviews, he was surprisingly articulate and generally careful in his word choices, but his self-centeredness was still evident. Michael said that he confessed to all his friends in order to share responsibility with them, not to brag or to be callous about Angel's death. Michael talked about how terrible it was for him to be in prison, how he was an opponent of solitary confinement, although he was glad to have quality time to work on himself. Michael was depressed in prison because he thought when he was released, he would never get a boyfriend or a job. As far as life after prison, it was all about how Michael could reinvent himself, how he could be redeemed. He had a number of ambitious goals. He wanted to showcase his art, to star on a reality TV show, and to recapture his former glory on the club scene. His attitude communicated a message something like, the fact that he committed murder shouldn't get in the way of his success. He paid his debt to society, plus the homicide was really a drug-fueled accident anyway. Michael believed that he was an inspiration to others. He claimed that people contacted him saying how he changed their lives. Michael claimed he accepted responsibility for the murder, but really it was more about blaming the drugs and the nightlife in New York City. The environment was just too chaotic and hostile. Michael attempted to apologize to Angel's family, saying that Angel was loved by him and his friends. That is, until he was brutally murdered and his body was dismembered. Michael left that part out. When considering all his interviews together, I think it's clear that Michael had no true remorse. He was only sorry that he had to go to prison. Michael was perpetually focused on seeking attention. He believed that he was a legendary figure who deserved praise and admiration. This whole manslaughter situation was just a blip on an otherwise spotless record. Michael insisted that he would never use drugs again, yet just a few years later, he would die of an overdose. I find it interesting that he blamed drugs for causing him to commit murder and yet chose to use drugs again. This might be the most significant proof that he had no remorse. He was willing to create an environment that existed the night he committed the murder. How worried was he about committing murder again if he would do that? 
Item number four, Michael Allig was probably both narcissistic and psychopathic. He disguised both of these traits. He tried to explain away his narcissistic behavior by saying that he was a club promoter. It was his job to be the center of attention. He needed to cause chaos so that people would go to the clubs. He tried to explain away his psychopathy by saying essentially the same thing. It was his job to shock and offend people. In reality, it's much more likely that Michael was narcissistic and psychopathic first, and his career choices resulted from those traits. He found a line of work which allowed him to satisfy his desires and achieve fulfillment. Now moving to my final thoughts. One of the major problems for Michael Aldig is that he never had any actual talent. He was simply someone who connected innocent people with drugs in a colorful and dramatic way. The media should have never glamorized Michael or the club kids. Holding their adventures out as success stories only encouraged them to cause more harm. Believing that people went to the nightclubs primarily to see Michael is like believing that people go to Walmart to see the greeter at the front door. Michael may have been a novelty who people wanted to see a few times, but the drugs kept people coming back. Ultimately, those same drugs that gave Michael fame and success would take everything from him. The drugs proved once and for all how they were always the star of the show. Those are my thoughts on the case of Michael Alec. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.